All right, John chapter 12, take your Bible, turn there. And uh, I, I went back over and looked at what I preached last Wednesday night. Um, and I'm, I'm going to, I was going to just kind of move on from this, from this idea. Uh, but there are a couple things that, that I want to, that I want to bring up that I didn't get a chance to get into last week. And um, in John chapter 12, starting in verse 17, we'll go down to verse 25. Um, this, of course, after, is after he has resurrected Lazarus uh, from the dead. And, uh, the, of course, the, a lot of people are following him as a result of that. But, you know, the religious leaders, they are against him because, for that very reason, they are against him and they're opposing him and they want him, they actually want him dead. They, they're, they're going to try to kill Lazarus. And I'm going, boy, well, that, that's a stupid plan. Okay? He'll just raise him back from the dead again. You kill him. Boom! Didn't work, did it? Okay? Which is how I like to play video games, JR. Which is why I don't, I don't own an Xbox or a PlayStation. I want them on a PC, a computer. Because generally, you can get cheat codes for it. And you can find out how to play without being killed. And that's how I play them. I don't like, I don't like losing. So, and in some cases, you put in a cheat code. Not only can you not be killed, but you're invisible to the enemy. So you're, like, you're standing right in front of them, and they're going, you know, and you just go, bam! Like, anyway, that's... But that's, they're trying to kill Lazarus. He's already died, rose again. What, do you, what makes you think that if you kill him again, it'll, it'll stick this time? I don't get that. But anyway, John chapter uh, 12, verse 17. The people therefore that was with him when he called Lazarus out of his grave, raised him from the dead, bear record. That's John's favorite phrase, by the way, bear witness or bear record. And you'll find that in 1 John 5, 7, for there are three that bear record in heaven. So that's how you know it's John's signature in a verse. Um, for verse 18, for this cause the people also met him, for they that heard that he had done this miracle. The Pharisees therefore said among themselves, perceive ye how ye prevail nothing. Behold, the world is gone after him. And there were certain Greeks among them that came up to worship at the feast. The same came before, therefore to Philip, which was of Bethsaida of Galilee, and desired him, saying, Sir, we would see Jesus. Philip cometh and telleth Andrew, and, and, and again Andrew and Philip tell Jesus. Jesus answered them, saying, The hour has come, and the Son of Man should be glorified. And I, and, and I want you to get this. And, and this is when, when we were singing earlier that song, about must Jesus bear his cross alone and all the world go free. There's a cross for everyone and there's a cross for me. And then it was talking about the crown. And I do. I, I sometimes, uh, I'm guilty of, of wanting the crown already. Um, wanting, wanting the glorification. It's not yet. It's not time. Our glorification is going to come when Christ appears in the air and the world then is going to see us with him. Okay? Uh, has anybody here ever met a celebrity before and you wanted your picture taken with him? You've done that? Who was it? Somebody on Days of Our Lives? Who was Shaq, Shaquille O'Neal? Did you get your picture taken with him? Well, let me tell you, let me give you a little secret. If you're ever going to get on an airplane and you see somebody famous before you go through the TSA line, get in right behind them. Because I guarantee you, they won't be paying attention to you. 
I got that was St. Louis Airport, and uh, Daryl Strawberry was in town for some reason, and I ended up behind him in the TSA line. And I, and I was just going to tap him, say, hey, I, you know, Daryl, you know, I like your ball playing or whatever. I like baseball. But I noticed all them gals that were working the TSA line, they were seeing him. They were going, hi, Daryl. Hi, Daryl. Hi, Daryl. And I'm going, boy, if I had a bomb, I could slip her in right here, right now. I could blow this place apart. Because they would not pay attention to me at all behind Daryl Strawberry. But anyway. Uh, we want to be when we want to be seen with people famous, whatever. When Jesus appears in the air, we're going to be seen with him. And the world is going to marvel. Now, down here, you identify with Christ. They're going to hate you. It's like identifying with Trump. OK, or identifying with Biden. OK. You're going to get a sticker on your shirt that says, I did this. <laughs> anyway, um, Jesus said, the hour has come that the Son of Man should be glorified. He was close to that time, but it wasn't quite yet. He said, look at verse 24. Verily, verily, I say unto you, except a corn of wheat fall into the ground and die, it abideth alone. But if it die, it bringeth forth much fruit. Now, number one, in this context, we can see that he was speaking of himself. He had his time to be glorified. What was, he, what was it he said? And I, if I be lifted up, I will draw all men unto me. Being, and he meant being lifted up on the cross. As Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have eternal life. Christ's glory was in his death on the cross. Okay, that was his glory. Um, I'm, J.R., I'm kind of like you. Anything has to do with World War II, especially D-Day, uh, there is a, Roy, you'd like this. There's a doc, there's a, it's a, it was an old TV broadcast of, um, oh, who used to do the CBS news, Walter Cronkite. And he is, this is in 1964. So it's like 20th anniversary of D-Day. And he is with, uh, Ike. He's, he's riding around in a Jeep with Dwight Eisenhower. And Eisenhower, he's already been president. He's one that was the, the commander in charge of D-Day. And he was taking um, uh, Walter Cronkite, you know, around the various places and showing him, you know, what all, what all strategies they had and so on. And then they got to that, that cemetery. And they said, there's like 9,000 crosses and stars of Judah out here. And he said, those are the ones that we couldn't identify. So we buried them here. And he said, 60%, this is Eisenhower, 60% of them we sent home to be buried with their family so their family could bury them at home. And I don't remember the number of how many, how many allied soldiers died on D-Day itself. Yeah, at least that. But um, that sounds about right. But the, the glory of that cemetery, you can't, you can't help but go to, a, even seeing that just on an old black and white newsreel, just seeing that, the glory of that cemetery. Those are men that jumped out in harm's way to prepare the 3,000 men just getting nailed on Utah Beach alone the first few hours just so the guys behind them could walk over their dead bodies and advance and, and capture those German soldiers. That's glory. Your glory is not in the great things that you do or the great things that you think you are. The glory comes, and this is a lesson I'm learning 
The glory is your sacrifice and what you yield and what you give up. That's your glory. Let's pray. Father, we ask your blessings upon your word tonight. Lord, open up, our, open up my eyes. Father, preach to me tonight. I need it. Lord, just bless your people tonight from this place around the world. Just do, Father, what you want to do, Lord. Just bless your people. Bless your word in Jesus' name. And all of God's people said, Amen. That's, to me, that's what he's getting at. He said, the hour has come, the Son of Man should be glorified. And it's his glorification was, what, what did Paul say? But God forbid that I should glory, save in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom the world is crucified unto me and I unto the world. What did Paul just say? That his, that his glory was in him being crucified with Christ. I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. That was his glory. What did he say in 2 Corinthians 12 when he was talking about that thorn that was in his flesh? He's asked God three times, take it out, take it out, take it out. And God said, my grace is sufficient for thee. And Paul said, I'll, I'll take that. I'll keep it. We'll, we'll just, God will just leave it that way. You can leave that thorn in my flesh. Because when I'm weak, then you're made strong in me. And that's the glory. Amen. And I don't care if you say amen or not. I'm saying amen to my own preaching. Because I'm agreeing with it. Because I'm guarantee it ain't coming from me. It's coming from the Holy Ghost. God knows what I've been through the last few days. All right? Uh, amen. Verse 25. He that loveth his life shall lose it. He that hateth his life in this world shall keep it unto life eternal. Now, uh, Job 14, verse 7, that's up on the screen there. There's hope of a tree. If it be cut down, that it will sprout again. And that the tender branch thereof will not cease. And what, what is that tree waiting on? That, that old dead stump sitting there. He's, I don't know if he says it here or later on. Through the scent of water. We know water is the word of God. We can get in these stump days. Where we just feel like old dead stumps. Not good for anything. God just might as well just get us out of here, take us out. We're good for nothing. And yet, you get a little bit of rain going through the scent of water, and all of a sudden, there's a blossom. You find out that tree ain't near as dead as what you thought it was. You find out that God is nowhere near done using you. In some cases, I don't know much about trees, but in some cases when people want, when they see a tree that they like, they think is pretty, instead of waiting for the seeds, they'll take branch cuttings of a tree. Am I right on that? My, Melissa, John, am I right on that? Got a thumbs up. They'll of a branch of that tree and they'll I guess keep it in water or whatever until they get it to where they're going to transplant it then they transplant it and all of a sudden now that same tree now lives somewhere else exact same tree even though it might might have come from North Carolina or it might have come from you know who knows where now it, that same tree is living in a new place and it's young again and it's going to start its life all over again. Whereas the tree that it came from might die in the next 10 years. That same tree is still alive somewhere else. And that's how God does ministries. That's how God raises up a generation. When I was here, when they dedicated this building... 
to be used for God's kingdom, God's glory's sake. I was, I was young. I didn't know exactly what was going on. I just knew that they had good singing and they had fried chicken downstairs. But I remember it was a building dedication and they, they set aside this building for the purpose of preaching and spreading the gospel of Jesus Christ. Now, all of those people that were here on that day, they're all dead and gone. Gone. But the church is still here and it is doing exactly what those people had hoped it would do some, what was that, 1974? So that's going to be what, 50? Huh? It's 48 years now. It's going to be 50 years in two years. 50 years later, 48 years later, is this church still spreading the gospel? Good grief. Where'd you, where'd you come in from? Uh, Atlanta. Atl yeah, that's right. You did say Atlanta. Okay. Well, it reached down to Atlanta, Georgia. That's where my uncle Juan, who just passed away, that's where he lived, just outside of Atlanta. And, uh, and he loved his church. He loved listening to uh, my preaching. He loved listening, watching the videos that I made. I just talked to my aunt the other day. She wanted to tell everybody thank you for praying for her. She sent a nice gift on behalf of my Uncle Juan to feed the people out in Kenya. God bless her. And uh, you continue to pray for my Aunt Mary. But anyway, um, turn to 1 Corinthians 15. I call it hot Atlanta. I've never been through Atlanta, but it wasn't, it wasn't 120 degrees. Good grief. How do y'all live down there? Oh, yeah, I know that. Don't, don't bring that up. Not only, you're not only sitting in the heat, but you can't get through town. Do what? No, you can't. Amen. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 35. This is, oh, man, I tell you what, I can read this passage a million times, not get everything out of it that's in it. Uh, 1 Corinthians 15, 1 Corinthians 15, this is where God showed me that angels have seed. They have DNA. And I, and I, I didn't know that. I didn't, I didn't even think of that. Until I was reading it one day or God drew, drew my attention to it one day or something like that. But it, man, it just hit me like a ton of bricks. In verse 35, Paul is going to explain the resurrection. Because he's dealing, Paul, remember, Paul's a Jew. In fact, just about from what we know, there's a question in my mind about Luke. Was he a Jew or not? And I'm not positive. Luke is not a Jewish name. It's Lukos, which is a Greek Gentile name. And some say he was a Jew, some say, well, I don't know. But all the heads of the 12 tribes were Jews. All the heads of the, all the 12 apostles were Jews. Christ himself being a Jew. But some of the Jews did not believe in a resurrection. And so Paul's going to straighten this out right here and right now. And he says in verse 35, but some man will say, how are the dead raised up? And with what body do they come? Paul says it and he doesn't hold back. Verse 36, thou fool, that which thou sowest is not quickened except it die. Quickened means made alive again. Thou fool. Don't you understand this? Boy, one thing I love about Sister Eunice back there, she's a gardener. She's a, she's a gardener, man. She's out there. She's got her, what all you got planted out there? Corn? You got tomatoes? What else? Greens? Oh, yeah. You got turnip greens? I like turnip greens. 
You couldn't, have got, you couldn't have made me eat turnip greens when I was a kid, but I like them. Yeah. It's like the old boy, that, these two farmers was talking, and one of them said, what do you feed your dog? He said, well, I feed my dog dog food. What do you feed your dog? He said, turnip greens. The other farmer said, man, I had no way I could get my dog to eat turnip greens. He said, mine wouldn't eat them for a month. That's an old joke. Anyway, some man will say, how are the dead raised up and with what body do they come? Thou fool, that which thou sowest is not quickened except it die. You are not dead yet. You're not there yet. You're not in heaven yet. Your glory's not here yet. Quit looking for your glory now. It will come. And that which thou sowest Thou sowest not that body that shall be, but bear grain. It may chance of wheat or some other grain. And I'll get you to say amen to the phrase, it's not the same body. Somebody say amen. It's a completely different body. It's a body that doesn't have, well, this body here is not like the new body. The new body doesn't have the aches and the pains and the ugliness and the stink that comes with this old body. But he said, verse 38, But God giveth it a body as it hath pleased him, and to every seed his own body. Again, we live in an age now where we know what this is now. For thousands of years, they just knew it as seed. They knew what seed was. They knew what uh, mustard seed was. They knew what wheat was. They knew what uh, other types of seed were. They knew what they knew what it was. They didn't know how it worked. They didn't know that it was a a twisted book of of uh, instructions and the the chemicals needed to make the different parts of the body. They didn't understand all of that. But now we know what it is, and the more we know about it, the more in awe I am at how amazing a book it is. Somebody say amen. I love it. This book, this book here, is what makes this church the way it is. It's what makes this church the way it is. There are things that are, that are in this book that makes us who we are. And there are other churches out there who are all using the same book, but they're a little different, aren't they? Well... When you take a look at my three daughters, you're looking at three entirely different human beings. That each one of them is a little bit like me and Lisa, and I'm not even going to get into which part's which. But they're sisters. They all came from the same DNA, same seed, and yet God did make them a little different, didn't he? And there are churches out there, some that are, that are kind of like us, some that are not kind of like us, but it doesn't matter because God made them the way he wanted to. Same DNA makes them all different, and yet we're all the same because we all come from the same seed. We all come from the same book. And the thing that I, I would just love to get pastors to realize is that when you're, when you're planting different seed, you're going to get a different crop than what you thought you were going to get. When you sow corruption, you reap corruption. When you sow into people corrupt Bibles, do not be alarmed when you see the corruption that those corrupt Bibles bring forth. Because they will. They have to. It's the law of seed. It's the law of seed. Okay? So, if Matthew ever suspects that he's adopted, 
All he's got to do is run a DNA check and they'll find out that yes, he's got my DNA and Lisa's DNA and there's no, there's no, there's no other way to it. He's our child. If he, if there was a crime committed, a murder or something like that, and Matthew says, I was never there, and yet his DNA is all over that room, there's no doubt about it. That's him. That was in that. I mean, courts of law now accept that. That's how it is. And when it comes to the seed of the word of God, if it's corruptible seed, it will bring forth corruptible fruit. There is no way. You, and Jesus said it that way. A good tree cannot bring forth bad fruit and a bad corrupt tree cannot bring forth good fruit. It just can't happen that way. Amen? Amen. Um, so then he says... Um, Verse 39, all flesh is not the same flesh, but there is one kind of flesh of men, another flesh of beasts, another of fishes, and another of birds. Notice he mentioned four things here. There's a reason for that. It has to do with the gospel and the seed of the gospel. What Peter said was the, um, the incorruptible seed of the word of God going into people's minds and their hearts, bringing them to the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And that's what makes people how they are. And then he said this, verse 40, and this is what, this is what got me. There are celestial bodies and bodies terrestrial. Now the word celestial means, it's where we get the word ceiling. In Spanish, in Italian, in French, in those languages that are based upon Latin, um, cielo, means the heavens celestial means of the heavenly realm so what is your body what is your bible telling you that the creatures and the things that exist in the angelic realm they have bodies they have bodies um I'm trying to think of a place in the Bible, and I don't think there is. Somebody correct me if I'm wrong. I'm trying to think of some place in the Bible where somebody saw a spirit, but all they saw was like a mist, and that was it. When somebody saw a, a, an angel, it was in the form of something. It was either in the form of like the two men that came to... Abram's, Abraham's house, then they went to Lot to rescue him out of, get him out of Sodom. Those were angels and they had the bodies of men. Um, the angel Gabriel, that had the body of a man. Satan has the body of a serpent or a dragon. He, that's his form, that's his body. Uh, there, there is an instance in, I think it's the book of Job. In fact, you know what? I think I almost turned right to it. Um, where, uh, Job's f friend, uh, maybe I didn't, but anyway, he sees a spirit and it's the form of, he sees the body of it or something like that. I'm trying to. Huh? Chapter 4. Well, I was way off. I was in 33. Yeah. Verse 12. Now a thing was secretly brought to me, and mine ear received a little thereof, and thoughts from the visions of the night when deep sleep fell upon men. Fear came upon me, and trembling, which made all my bones to shake. Then a spirit passed before my face, the hair of my flesh stood up. It stood still, but I could not discern the form thereof. An image was before mine eyes. There was silence. I heard a voice saying, shall mortal men, so on. So there was a place where he could not discern the form thereof. But in practically every other case, those spirits had a form. And this is what throws some people off saying that the sons of God are angels and how could they have made it with daughters of men because they're like Casper the ghost. They, they just walk through 
walls and walk through trees and walk through people and you can't touch the, anything like that. That's, but that's not true. That's not what the Bible teaches us about the bodies of angels. But th there is a difference and that they can go through walls and ceilings and, and can be seen or not be seen if they don't want to be. That spirit obviously didn't want to be seen, but it had a celestial body and there are bodies terrestrial. And from that, we go back to that previous verse there in verse 38, to every seed his own body. If it has a body, it has seed. And if it has seed, it comes from a body. And there's just no doubt in my mind about it. And he said, but the glory of the celestial is one and the glory of the terrestrial is another. There's one glory of the sun, another glory of the moon, another glory of the stars. For one star differeth from another star in glory. Uh, so also is the resurrection of the dead. It is sown in corruption. It is raised in incorruption. It is sown in dishonor. It is raised in glory. It is sown in weakness. Raised in power. It is sown a natural body. It is raised a spiritual body. How many things did he say here? I've never counted this. It is sown in corruption. Raised in incorruption. Sown in dishonor. Raised in glory. Sown in weakness. Raised in power. Sown a natural body. Raised a spiritual body. Eight. You know what eight's the number of? New life. Isn't that neat? I like it. I never counted that before. There is a natural body. There is a spiritual body. And I promise you that what comes out of your grave one of these days will, thank God, Roy, look nothing like the old man we roll down inside that hole. Amen. Nothing like it. Uh, then he's talking about, and it so it was written, the first man, Adam, was made a living soul when God breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. The last Adam was made a quickening spirit. In other words, Christ doesn't receive life. He gives life. He gives life. He's a quickening spirit. His spirit makes people alive. Howbeit that which is, that was not first which is spiritual, but that which is natural. And afterward, that which is spiritual. The first man is of the earth, earthy. The second man is the Lord from heaven. And that, that fits in with everything you see in the Bible. What testament comes first? The Old Testament does. It's the testament of the law of Sinai. You must do this. You must do this. You, it, in order to live, you must do this. Well, they didn't do it. We haven't done it. Nobody's done it except Christ. He did it. So now we have a new covenant and the new covenant came second so that the first could be done away with. So now there's room for the second covenant. Christ fulfilled the terms and the obligations of the first covenant by his righteousness. He never sinned. He was the sinless, spotless Lamb of God, fulfilling the terms of the Old Testament. Now that the Old Testament terms have been satisfied, God can take that and set it aside, and now we can have a new covenant. Because the old covenant's been fulfilled. Now there's a new covenant. Which which body comes first? Which body comes first? The spiritual body or the earthly body? The earthly body does. What and that's the whole idea behind being born again. The first birth is okay. Second birth is out of this world, literally out of this world. So you understand the concept behind that, and it, and it all has to do with a seed. And how big does the seed have to be? Grain of mustard seed. It's all it has to be. It's just a little bitty thing. It doesn't take much. But if you'll... If you'll believe this book, and you'll call on the name of the Lord, thou shalt be saved I, I get 
the emotions that are there was God reminded me again the last thing that my dad ever did in this world was call on the name of the Lord. He didn't go to church near as much as I did. He didn't preach a sermon. I don't know how much of the Bible he read. But I know on that last day, when I said, Dad, you ready to pray? Yeah, let's pray. I know where he is. Just takes that much. Amen. Don't let men put burdens on you and your salvation that are too heavy for you to carry. Don't let men bind things on you and on your salvation that make it impossible for you to live the life that Christ called us to live. Amen.